And they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. Let's pray. Lord Christ, uh, having heard your word read and anticipating you speaking into our hearts, Lord, I pray that you will um, come to your own people. Not, not, don't let it just be me up here, Lord, but may it be you working in our midst today as we reflect on your word and all that you have for us. And Lord, make yourself glorious in our eyes and draw our hearts towards you. And we ask this for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Please be seated. So I was looking at all these readings and um, my heart was drawn to this story of the call of Rebecca to be Isaac's bride. And this is a story that is very early in the story of the people of God, um, way back in ancient times. And this is the story of how Abraham sent his servant, probably Eliezer of Damascus, to find a wife <clears throat> for his son Isaac. And, and this is the story of how that servant met Rebecca, and then he's, he's retelling how he met her to her brother Laban, who's probably her guardian. And, and then how we heard how she agrees to go meet her future husband. It's a sweet story. I love it. And it's, you know, it, it's kind of, I have to admit, it's kind of like the script from like a Bronze Age Hallmark movie or something, isn't it? You can imagine. Uh, but, you know, there's so much more than just a love story here. We've got to really dig in. I want to look at it um, and see what we can find in it by God's grace and help today. So if you read earlier, this is, you know, Genesis 24. So there's not a whole lot of Bible before that, right? The flood is, 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 was within, you know, living memory almost. Uh, you know, everybody would have known about the flood that was left on the earth at that point. And the earth is starting to repopulate, right? And, and, there, and there are, by then, hundreds of thousands of people probably populating the earth. So why are we hearing about this one story, this one family, and this one young woman and all that? Um, this is being told for a purpose, because this is the continuation of the story of God engaging with his people through, this is a continuation of the covenant given to Adam and Eve. Remember when it was prophesied that uh, one, would, one of their descendants would crush the serpent's head, right? It's a foretelling of, of Jesus who would come. And then and through one of their descendants, what has to keep going through the family line somehow, right? And, and then we see that God, after the flood, he, made, he renewed, he sort of doubled down on the covenant, right? And he made it more focused and more concrete and expansive through his work in Abraham. That through Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed through his seed, through his line. And we just heard last week in Genesis 22, the story of the near sacrifice of Isaac. It was prophesied over that young man that one of Abraham's offspring through Isaac would possess the gate of his enemies. And, and then there's a promise again that again the Lord would bless all the nations of the earth through this boy that was being, you know, that had been miraculously born to Abraham and then who would come from him, right? And all of this, of course, is leading to just detail after detail and story after story, preserving that line, preserving that promise, all pointing towards when Christ would finally come himself and in my reading I think it's highly likely this is at least part of why all the baby boys who came from Abraham, Abraham's line were circumcised so that every time a married couple would come together they'd have a very visual reminder of this promise that the salvation of the world would come through the line of Abraham and they had this promise every time they would come together as husband and wife. And then they would wonder if, you know, maybe the Savior will be born through our family somehow. You know, what a precious and holy thing. And what a sacred duty they had as husband and wife, yeah? Um, and, and so now we see in this story of, of finding Rebecca for Isaac, um, just one instance of God arranging for that lineage to come about. See, this is more than just a love story. This is God providentially working to provide the Savior he had promised all the way back at the beginning. And so he had miraculously provided a son to Abraham and Sarah in their old age with the birth of Isaac, and now it's time to continue the line. And so Isaac needs a wife. 
And Abraham is being obedient. He's not going to let his son choose one of the women from the land around him. These people are to be distinct. So he sends back to his own clan, his own tribe, to bring a wife from there. It cannot be from the women of Canaan. And so he sends a servant on this very important mission. And in this story, I don't know if you caught all the details in it, but God was working in all the details, wasn't he? Arranging for this thing um, to happen in just the right way. And, and, and this just testifies to the fact that God is faithful and that f- since the beginning, he's been preparing our world and his people for the advent of Christ, right, from, from the beginning. I mean, it was foreordained from the, for, before the foundation of the world that all this would take place. And, and, and this would culminate in what Paul calls a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, that is in Jesus, things in heaven and things on earth. And it all comes about through finding this young woman and you know, some dusty camel ride and all this kind of stuff. I mean, God's in the details. And he's arranging all these things. Every detail matters and God's eye is on it all. He's working in all of it. And it's just a quick word of encouragement. It's no different for you and for me, is it? God working in all the details of our lives. You might feel like you're a pinball being knocked around here and there. And I'm not saying you don't, you're not act, you know, bouncing around like a pinball, but it's God doing it. Right? And he's, he's working in your life to form and fashion you into the image of Christ, to conform you to his son. He's come to take you as his bride, you know? And this is all part of his plan. Him bringing about his purposes for us and for his glory through us. This is just a testimony to how God works. And so, in this story of Abraham's servant going to find this wife or his son, it's just, and again, another example of the faithfulness of God in keeping his promise. And so, and just think about all the details that had to come together for this to happen the way it did. I mean, he had to have, God had to provide a faithful servant for Abraham and Eliezer, didn't he? Right? And, and, and it's remarkable to see Eliezer, his, his devotion to Abraham almost rivals his devotion to Abraham's God. And the man is so faithful and loyal. He loves this man um, completely and wholeheartedly. He loves Abraham, loves the family, and his absolute devotion and loyalty to him. And think about, I'm, I'm, we're thinking about Eliezer now and the qualities that he represents. Um, and going on this mission, he relies completely on God. Isn't it wonderful when um, God's people go about God's business relying entirely on God? That last part's difficult. We, we want to be, you know, we're God's people. We want to go about God's business, but we don't always rely on God, do we? It's wonderful to see a great example of someone doing this. And, and Eliezer's not afraid to be very specific in his prayers, was he? You know, he doesn't want any ambiguity. He doesn't want any room for error. He wants to get it right. He wants to make sure he, he talks to the right woman and, and, and does it just right and invites her in and all this. And so he throws himself onto God's mercy. And I love how specific his prayer is. It gets very detailed, you know. It's like a, it's almost like a, a password kind of thing in an old spy movie or something, right? You know, in the spy, they like, go knock on the door and they'd open the little slot or whatever and, and you have to give the code word and they'd respond just right back. You know, something like, well, you know, the swallow flies at dawn. <laughs> And the cardinal sings at, you know, at daybreak or something. You know, just whatever random phrases that are meant to go. And this is how you know, this is confirmed that you're in the right place, the right time, talking to the right people. So there he is. He's made his long trek. He's got this, him and his ten camels and all of his men and laden with riches and gifts. And they need water after their journey. So there they are. And, and he waits by the well where he knows the women from the tribe and the clan are going to come down to draw water for the, in the evening. And so he's praying. He he wants to be sure. And he says, let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And let her respond, drink, and I will water your camels also. You know, let her be the one that you've appointed for your servant Isaac. And then he prays this. I, I love this. He says, by this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. And lo and behold, in the mercies of God, it all comes to pass in just this way. He sees Rebecca with the jar. She must have been pretty strong. Had a big water jar on her shoulders. And, um, and he sees her, and he says, maybe that's the one. And so he gives the first half of the co- passphrase, you know, the code. Please let down your water jar that I may drink. And then she follows the script perfectly, right? 
drink, and I'll water your camels also. What does Eliezer do? I think he was stunned. He's like, this is actually working. <laughs> this is awesome. So he just says, the text tells us that he just, he just gazes wonder at the young woman. I think he's just stunned that he's actually, it's actually working out this way that he prayed. And he's so glad to see it. And, he just, and then he gives her some gold, including a nose ring. So it's not, you know, kids wanting nose rings today isn't all that bad. Huh? Rebecca had one, so. Anyway, um, he gives her some gold gifts and, and this confirms that she's, and, and then he does one last double check, you know, tell me your family again and, you know, confirms that it's from Abraham's relatives. And, um, and then he does the only thing you can do in a moment like that. Do you notice this detail? It says, the man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord. His heart just overflowed. And he praises God for his steadfast love and for his faithfulness. That's such a great example for us, yeah. And, um, and then everything unfolds, of course, wonderfully. It's the best kind of arranged marriage is the one that God has arranged, yeah. And her family is agreeable, and the lavish gifts are given, and Rebecca consents to go with this man, and, and along with her little entourage, and, and she goes back to Canaan to meet Isaac. That's a great story. But we can do more than just admire this really sweet story. We, we can keep mining it for gold and for jewels. And there's a lot of Christian meaning we can squeeze out of this thing. That's what I want to spend the rest of our time doing this morning. I mean, any child with a basic understanding of the gospel and a bit of imagination can start to make some connections here if they just think on the story long enough. Right? And this is especially true for those who are the children of God. Those of us who have had our eyes opened by God so that we can see the truths of God. You see how that works? God works by His Spirit to open our eyes to, to think His things. And by God's grace, you know, we're always thinking of Christ. We're always looking for Christ. And this is especially true when we read the Old Testament. So we need to look for gospel truths in this text. And Jesus hints at this sort of dynamic of the Spirit opening our eyes to see things um, that others can't see today when he's, he's sort of getting weary with the Jews, right? And he says, to whom are these things revealed? You know, Lord, I thank you, Father, that these, are, these things are revealed to the wise and the understanding of who they're revealed to, those who are self-confident and learned and, and are gotten there by their own strength and their own cleverness. No. He says, no, these things are revealed not to the wise and understanding, but unto babes. That is, little babies, those who are the children of God. Those who are babes in Christ. Have their eyes opened and their hearts opened to look for Christ everywhere. And so I want to look at Eliezer a little more closely in this whole, in this whole story with a Christian lens, yeah? What, what does God have for us? So I, I think one obvious one is that Eliezer is the servant of Abraham is a great model for us as servants of Christ, yeah? I mean... It's easy to see in his deep devotion to his master. He loves Abraham dearly. And he serves him so faithfully. And this is all the more remarkable because if you know the backstory again, if you've been reading earlier in Genesis, you would see that before Abraham knew he would have a son Isaac, God had promised him children, but they weren't coming and he's getting old and advanced in age. And he says, Lord, if, if you know, you've not yet provided his son, so unless something happens, I'm gonna have to make Eliezer of Damascus, my chief servant, my heir. You know, Eliezer in the story today tells us that Abraham was great. He was very rich. All the kings and the nations among whom he was living were afraid of him. He was so powerful. He was a weighty man. And Eliezer was in a position to get all of this. It would all be passed to him. But then what happens? Isaac, an heir, is miraculously born. Does Eliezer take his ball and go home? He stays and serves the family in love. See, this, he knew this child was a gift from God, born of covenant, God's covenant faithfulness. And so we don't hear his reaction specifically. This is sort of sanctified conjecture on my part, but look how he's behaving here, looking for this bride for Isaac, Yeah. 
He continues to serve the family with utter love and devotion. And later on, he even calls Isaac his master. He didn't say, you know, that snot-nosed punk who stole everything from me. Right? He says, no, that's my master. You know, and we don't know why he loves the family the way he does. All we know is that Abraham loves him. He must have if he's going to make him his heir. And then that he loves Abraham and the whole family. And this reminds me of what we looked at last Sunday. We are talking about being, are we going to be slaves of sin or slaves of Christ, yeah? All those who are rescued from the slavery of sin and death and are given true faith in Christ Jesus become slaves to his righteousness, slaves to his love. You know, and they don't obey God because they have to or because they're afraid, but because he has already shed immeasurable love on them. And it is their heart's delight to know him and to love him and to serve him. And they just want to give the love back that they've received. This is what a servant in Christ looks like. And I find some of this character in Eliezer serving Abraham and, and through Abraham serving God. And he displays all the fruits of the Spirit here in this mission, in my estimation. You know, um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, all of it, yeah? Self-control, all of it, right? I mean, he's quick to obey. He's faithful to his master. He takes the initiative and does all the planning for the mission, Right? He's humble. He's responsible with someone else's stuff. We all need to remember that everything we own is a gift from God. It is not ours, right? Our homes and our cars and all of it, the clothes in your back right now are a gift from God. These are God's things that he gives to you to steward. Ilias is a great example of stewarding other people's things. Right? He acts with complete integrity towards someone else's future wife. Right? I mean, the girl was beautiful. But does he show a hint of anything inappropriate? No. Right? And most importantly, you can see this in his prayer and the way he worships. He trusts God completely, even in the details. This is not a great example for us as a servant of Christ. And this is, this is wonderful. Um, and it's a wonderful example for us also to do even more than that, to, to keep in mind in our jobs. You know, on Thursday nights, I'm going through with some men on, on a book of, on work. What is our Christian attitude towards our, you know, our job, our day job? And, and in Ephesians 6, we get some great, some great guidance from Paul to sort of how to act like Eliezer, you know, a good Christian in the midst of, of our jobs. Um, he's giving direction to the bond servants of his day. This is sort of like the lowest of the low, you know, servants in wealthier households, right? People of low status. And he says, essentially, when they serve their sort of earthly master, the head of the house or whatever, he says, they're to do it with reverence and sincerity as if they were serving Christ, right? He says, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord, not to man. So when you work for your boss, you are not really simply serving your boss or the board or whatever. You're serving God through them in what you do. And then to the wealthy, to the ones who sort of are over these bond servants or to employers or whoever else, he says this. And he says, do the same to them. Operate in the same way. Knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So God doesn't care if you're cleaning the toilets at the company, you're the CEO of the company. There is one master who is over us all. And everything we do is to serve him. No matter what your circumstance is. And so this tells us how we're to go about our work. Once we belong to Christ, it's all for him. It's all for his glory. It's like Paul said, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. He's talking about sexual morality there, but I think it's just, it applies generally to morality and everything we do in this life. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify God with everything you do in your body. All right, and as our Lord calls out to us this morning, you know, sort of as our employer, so to speak, as our master, as our Lord, you know, our pre peace and rest is not found in... in giving into the tyranny of sin, leading to suffering and death, but our peace and rest is found 
in knowing and loving and serving him. Just as he called out this morning to the crowds, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. With a master like that, it's easy to be faithful like Eliezer, isn't it? And so, more though even than that, there is an image that's here that applies especially to me, and I'm being a little self-indulgent here, but I want you to understand in a new and fresh way sort of how church is meant to work. Me as your pastor, me as your priest, right? It's a wonderful example for me in how I'm to interact with you, his bride. Isn't that a wonderful connection? Right? You don't belong to me. You belong to him. And my job is to deliver you safely to your true spouse, which is Jesus Christ. I mean, it's. I like to think, again, more holy speculation. At least I hope it's holy and sanctified. Uh, But I imagine them going on the camels... You know, so Eliezer's got, got his men with him and, and Rebecca's got her, her, her girls with her and, and they're trekking across back to Canaan. What did they talk about? Right, were they just like, gee, sure is hot today, huh? You know, it's just awkward small talk like that. No, I think Eliezer was teaching this young woman and her retinue all the things that God had been doing in their lives and in this family. I think he was, he was instructing her in the ways of the Lord, introducing her to everything. Um, You know, he was telling her, I bet you about her new home, about Abraham and and Sarah and about God's call in their lives and and how Isaac was this miracle child and about all the covenant promises of God that are now coming through this one singular family and how there was now hope for man because um, the God who had so recently flooded the earth in his wrath had made a covenant with Abraham and his people that now instead of being cursed, the nations of the world would be blessed by God instead. Right? And that this would come through the son of promise, through her soon to be husband Isaac. And now he says, Now, Rebecca, all this, the promise is coming to you. And from your womb will come the Savior of the world. I think he's teaching her and informing her of all these things and how through her would the promise would be fulfilled that God would bless the earth and save all humanity. Paul calls that giving her the whole counsel of God. You know, he was being a faithful messenger of his master. He was not acting in his own self-interest. He was not trying to steal the attention of this beautiful young woman. He was entirely appropriate and he kept his role in mind the entire time because he had higher pleasures in mind, the pleasure of God. And he had his relationships back home too much to even think about doing anything untoward. And so I find in Eliezer and the way he handles the situation a wonderful model for myself because, again, you're the bride, I'm the servant. In the book of Revelation, it is the wedding feast of the Lamb, not the wedding feast of Jeremy. Right? It's about him. And so my job is to tell you all that God has done so that you can hear about God's faithfulness, about God's love for mankind, God's love for you, even the difficult stuff. I have to tell you all of it so you'll know who he is, so you can love him for yourself. That's why I do what I do. Right? And this brings me to the second point for me. Again, my job being to escort you on your way home to him. Today, it saddens me to say that many pastors, and this has been the case throughout the history of the church, but still it seems especially prevalent today, many pastors don't give the whole counsel of God to the bride of Christ. Why is that? Because they're trying to steal her attention for themselves. as they ride along to their destination. 
They don't tell the people everything they need to hear out of the Bible. Because they say, you know, they're doing this in the interest of the bride and the bridegroom. And, you know, and the focus, though, if you're not telling everything, all the counsel of God, the focus is really in gathering the bride to himself. Right? And if that's the case, you have to wonder where that shepherd really is leading that congregation, yeah? Is it to the bridegroom or off a cliff? It's such a weighty responsibility. I have to be self-aware the whole time of what I'm doing. This is what I'm about. It's not about me. It is about him. And I have to deliver you safely. I'm not the groom. I'm the servant for the groom. Right? And I must never try and get your attention to me, but direct it to him. And if you are ever tempted to compliment me or cling to me, not all of you are, but I think some of you might be a little bit, my job is to deflect that, take your hands off of me, and put them on Christ. Yeah? That's my role. I am just an aliaser. And I, I keep my speculation about what they talked about on the road, Eliezer and, and Rebecca and all of them. Um, neither do I doubt that Eliezer had been singing Isaac's praises the whole time. Wait till you meet him. He's so wonderful. He's such a great young man and all these skills and talents and he's so handsome and blah. On and on, I'm sure he went. Getting her ready, yeah, to meet him. See, building up the anticipation in her heart so she would long to meet him. She would long, I can't wait to meet this guy. He's so wonderful. If he's half as wonderful as you say he is, I'm going to be a blessed woman. It's going to be amazing, yeah? And he was doing all this so that she would be eager and ready to love him, to embrace him. Not to embrace Eliezer, but to embrace Isaac, the one for whom she'd been called and prepared. Right. And, and so and I think the confirmation of it is in, in what happens when they finally do meet, right? Um, they start to finally draw close with their little caravan. And, and we hear that Isaac is in the fields. What's he doing? He's meditating. He wasn't thinking about, you know, I wonder how far Jupiter is from here. He was meditating on the covenant promises of God and, and the one who would call his father and himself. He's, he's praying out in the field. And then he sees them. And he starts walking to meet them. And he's like, Lord, is this, the, is this time? Is this them? Surely it is. Right? And then Rebecca, from afar, seems to recognize him, right? And it's just some guy walking in the field. Why would she stop her camel and dismount and inquire, who is this? Is this you know, is this him? Right? I mean, she seems to recognize him, I think, based, I would think, on all that Eliezer had told her. And her heart is drawn towards this, this figure coming. It's, who is that man walking in the field to meet us? You know, who is that man? Is, I think she really means, is that him? Is that my husband? And Eliezer says, I think with a smile on his face, and his heart must have been full of pride and joy, and gratitude to God when he got to say, that is my master. And this is my privilege, is to tell you about Jesus. And the best thing ever is when you get to meet him for yourself, and I get to say, that's my master, that's who I've been talking to you about. There he is, now you know him for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. And he's way better than I could have ever described. So I find this very personally encouraging. There I am crying in the coffee shop thinking about these things. It's, it so beautifully describes all that I do among you. you know, bringing you the word, bringing you gifts right, from him and the word and the sacraments to you who have been called to be the bride of Christ. And I urge you to come. Right? And, I, and I want to tell you even more about him as we journey together. And, and again, I live for that moment when you get to meet him for yourself. And I know that you've been in contact with him and been in prayer with him and he has met you and that union has happened, you know. Um, and I get to say, yes, that is my master. You've met him. That is him. Right? And as Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. See, I'm not making this stuff up. This is the model 
for how a church is supposed to work. And what was Isaac's reaction to the bride he'd received from faithful old Eliezer? It says he took Rebecca, she became his wife, and he loved her. You can imagine that she would have been reasonably a little anxious. Is he going to like me? I've left everything behind, right? I don't know, maybe uh, I'm not his type, or... Maybe something about him, you know, maybe, maybe something about me will annoy him or whatever, you know? How's this going to go? Will he love me or not? Beloved, in Christ, there is no wondering whether or not he loves you. He's already declared it to be so. He's already proven it. Through his offering of himself on the cross to redeem you. See, you may not have known him your whole life, but he's known you your whole life. And before you were a twinkle in your father's eye, he's known you. Again, from the foundation of the world. Christ has orchestrated this story and all the stories of the Bible and all of it in his love for you. Working in all the millennia of the stories, through all the centuries, to bring himself into a world to redeem us from sin. And, and then he's working in all the circumstances of your life, bringing you to be born and bringing you to this point so he can call you and bring you to himself. Right? Sending people like me or a godly friend or a Gideon Bible in a hotel room or something, getting the word to you so you could hear his voice and he could speak to you of his love and then some friend or some minister or whatever would escort you along the way and, and then present you to the bride as a bride unto himself so that he can love and cherish you as his own flesh and delight in you forevermore. All his providence and all his care and all his energy and focus has gone into bringing this about and it is glorious in our eyes. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Christ, all the things you've done to win us to yourself, all the things you've arranged, all the hardness in our heart that we who were once your enemies have now become the servants of your love. Help us to meditate on these things, Lord. Draw us closer to you that we would know you and rejoice in your love. And I ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen.